The recording should be on right now. So, okay, so we'll get started. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Jenkins Online Meetup. This is um, Wednesday, October 5th, 2022. Uh, this is Jenkins Google Summer of Code 2022. And this is the final phase uh, where our GSOC contributors will show or demo uh, what they've done in this past season and um, what they've learned from it. Oops, too far. Sorry about that. Okay, so the Jenkins Online Meetup is a community-driven virtual meetup group. Um, we discuss all things and everything Jenkins from case studies, success stories, um, lessons learned, et cetera. And it, it is a channel for Jenkins developers. So we're always looking for speakers. So if you have a story to share with us, please um, submit a, uh, an application through the, the uh, links there. Some housekeeping notes uh, for Q&A, please put your questions in the Zoom chat or the Q&A window. One of us will respond to it as soon as we can. Uh, with regards to GSOC discussions, we have a Gitter channel for that. And then we also, um, we're also available after this event via Gitter or Discourse. And of course, code, code of conduct applies here. And it simply means being nice and respectful to each other. So Jean-Marc. Okay, thank you, uh, Lisa. So uh, my name is Jean-Marc Mason, uh, located in Brussels here. And uh, on behalf of the uh, uh, Google Summer of Code org admin team, which is here represented. So we had Alyssa, Chris Stern, uh, and myself uh, here, we are very happy to present this uh, last uh, uh, online meetup where the this year's contrib uh, uh, GSOC contributors will share uh, the results of their work uh, during this summer. So very happy uh, with that and with all the work that has been uh, done. So today uh, we'll give a small overview of what uh, GSOC 2022 at Jenkins uh, was. Then we'll move uh, to the different um, project presentations and demos. And uh, in each, after each presentation, we'll have a dedicated Q&A time uh, for each project. And at the end, we will have a global uh, questions and answer uh, uh, for the whole uh, project. Next slide. So uh, Google Summer of Code at uh, Jenkins is already starting to be a, lo a long uh, story. So it's a fifth year that uh, our project is participating uh, to that. And this year's edition uh, has, has continued on uh, this tradition very strongly. So we had four projects with four new con uh, uh, contributors, nine mentors to uh, help them uh, through the summer. And all four, four projects reach a happy end, a successful uh, end. So these are the four projects uh, that were uh, worked on during this summer. Uh, if you want to have more technical in-depth details about um, uh, all these projects, have a look to the URL at the end of this, uh, this slide where you can read and have the links to uh, the various things that were produced by the projects. Next slide. So these are the... Um, the participants to this edition, uh, very happy to have spent this summer together uh, with them. Uh, Hoshikash um, had an um, uh, had something that, uh, that he was not available today, and uh, he's very sad of that. 
uh, and he will be represented by his mentor. Thank you, Mark, for jumping in and uh, representing him. Next slide. So we're going to start here with the first uh, presentation and the first on the row is uh, Diraj. So start sharing your screen and the floor is yours. Thank you. So I think you might be able to see my slide full screen. Yes. It's awesome. Moving. There you go. So hi, everyone. My name is Deera Singh Jodha, and I'm representing our project titled as Plugin Health Scoring System. And my lovely mentors are Adrian, Jake, and Aditya. And it goes without saying that without their help and support, uh, we would not be here at this stage of this project and competing GSOC successfully. So this is how we are going to be spending the next 15-ish minutes. And uh, I'll be starting up by telling uh, briefly about the project. Then we'll be going through a very short, quick demo. Then we'll be uh, seeing the achievements of this project. And I'll be sharing the next steps that we have for us. Uh, and uh, then I'll be sharing my learnings, which will be followed by Q and A's. So please keep your questions ready. So about the project, what we are trying to do here is to calculate health score for the plugins. And uh, we try to do that by taking the composite scores of two things. First one is we want to find out how well a plugin performs on a set of predetermined probes. And second, we want to use this data to and combine it with the weights for each of those probes. So when I say set of predetermined probes, I mean anything from, let's say, for example, number of open issues uh, a plugin has in its repository or something like whether the given plugin repository has a Jenkins file or not, or it can be like latest release date of a plugin. So these are the probes that you can have. And by weight, uh, the weight of a probe signifies how strongly does a probe wants to affect the health score of a plugin. So for example, if we think that having a Jenkins file in a plugins repository is extremely important and crucial, then we would give this probe a very high weight value so that it affects the health score in that way. So this is how the architecture diagram that we designed looks like. And at the top side, you can see the Jenkins update center and these yellow boxes are the processes which contains the core logic of how things are working. And uh, at the bottom side, you can see the Postgres database, which captures all the observations and data related to the plugin. And on the top right side, you can see the two areas where we want to display the health score on the UI. So it's plugin.jenkins.io and plugin manager of Jenkins. So just for your reference, the left half of this architecture diagram is going to be visible to you during the demo because that is where we are as part of the current state of the project. So when we think of evaluating a plugin, what we mean by that is we, you would need to set aside at least one hour and uh, go through the manual steps of looking at the plugins repository and all the files and seeing the form XML file, checking out the values. So it's a very manual task. So, and you have to multiply that by 1800 plus plugins in the Jenkins ecosystem. And that's the amount of time that you would need to set aside in order to evaluate all the plugins in the Jenkins ecosystem. So I think it's safe to say that no one would want to voluntarily take up this task of man manually evaluating this, uh, the state of plugins. But there might be some one, some group of people who would want to automate this manual process. And that group of people is us. So this is what we are doing as part of this project. And uh, of course, our end goal is to deliver better uh, I mean, improved uh, user experience for the Jenkins plugin users. And we want to make this whole process community, community driven. And by that, we mean we want to make sure that in the future, we see that people are coming in the project and uh, adding in more probes files using the framework that we have developed and then participate in the surveys where we decide the weight given to each probe. So we want to make this all process fair and open 
uh, as part of this community driven initiative so it's time for a quick demo and uh, so i've started my project already and if you want to know how to do that you can refer the readme file of the repository and uh, on localhost 8080 slash probes you can see this list of probes that we have currently live as running in the project so we made this page uh, to uh, to give anyone a peek into what's uh, the state of this project so you can see the first probe is deprecated plugin probe which tells you if a given plugin is deprecated or not second word second one gives you the latest uh, commit date for a, a plugin then third one tells you whether the given scm link of a plugin is valid or not fourth one finally tells you whether the given plugin is up for adoption so if you want to view the same page the on your local machine uh, i mean or you can say that if you want to view the deployed version of this page you will need to visit this link plugin-health.jenkins.io/probes so you can see there's only two of them two of the plugin uh, probes listed here so we need to update that but this is where you can see it this is the deployed version of the project so now that we know the list of probes currently running live in this project so let's see the magic of probe engine which runs these probes and populates the database with its observations and uh, for that i would take you to my ide screen and on my database i'll run this simple query of select star from plugins and you would see these records in this format so in let's say in record this first record you can see let's just only focus on this details object so these are key value pairs scm uh, probe has a status of success because the plugin scm link is valid deprecation probe is also success because this plugin is not deprecated up for adoption is a success because it's the plugin is not up for adoption and last commit date gives you its last commit date as promised and its status is success so this is the state for one plugin and similarly you can find all these observations for all the other plugins as well so that's how the database gets populated by the four currently live plugins now let me take you back to the slides and so let me share with you our achievements at as part of this uh, project that we were able to do so first of all we have this probe engine running live in our project and uh, i like to refer it as the heart of this project because it's the single most uh, most important thing because due to this all the probes are running and the database is getting populated and everything so this was designed and developed by adrian so a big thanks to him and uh, and all the probes are now getting listed on the ui for anyone's reference so let me talk to you about the uh, next steps like what do we have next for this project if you are interested to know uh, so if you if you're curious or interested so we want to extend the probe engine and by extend and mean that we want to make it more we want to improve it more uh, because there's always room for improvement and you want to make it compatible with different kinds of probes because people can get very creative in future so that's that's something will be happening and uh, we want to broaden the suite of probes by adding in more and more probes so that the health score is calculated by very smart list of probes and finally we want, we want to generate the health scores and we want to display them on the relevant ui and uh, document the whole process so that it's uh, easier for anyone to understand and anyone can contribute uh, by looking at the documentation so to your uh, to the right side of the screen you can see this prototype shared with me um, by jake so on the left side of this image you can see these filters that you can have uh, to you know filter all these health score so it's a prototype and this is how the uh, jenkins plugin site is going to look like and uh, on the right side you can see all these plugin cards and 93 by 100 is the sample mock data for a health score so this is how the ui is going to look like with the health score on the plugin site so if you click on any of those cards of a plugin you would be redirected to similar kind of page so for example for kubernetes plugin you are seeing a health score of 93% so someone would get curious why do i 
why does this plugin has 93% score so we would be displaying a detailed breakdown of why it has 93% so these are the list of probes that contributed to this score and if you click on so this is the plan that if you click on any of these probes you will be redirected to a very helpful how to guide which will tell you that how can you improve a score for this given probe right so this is the imagined end result on the ui of the whole uh, health scores so i wanted to take a moment and share with all of you my learnings because part of this program has been very very um, very interesting for me and it it was a great learning experience because due to this i got to learn and improve my interpersonal skills because this is an environment is an open environment and uh, being part of an open source uh, project it's different from any kind of you know closed source or any corporate environment so and we worked remotely so this uh, this was an opportunity for me to improve on my asynchronous communication as well so there were lots of uh, weekly meeting plannings and uh, discussing the next pr and you know working on it asking doubts and i mean moving once one pr at a time so this was extremely interesting and great thing to learn and then as part of the whole journey i also get to increase my knowledge on the system designing aspect as well because uh, my mentor adrian especially he worked on uh, lots of interesting pr and i got to review them and i asked him so many questions and that's how i got to learn like hey how that's how you design something and that's how it comes to reality so most of them were related to java so that eventually led to the fact that i uh, started to increase on my java knowledge as well by using the development best practices so a big big shout out to adrian for helping me out here now if you're interested to know what's next for this project and you want to you know uh, just ask us any questions like hey how does this work i, I want to contribute or anything so these are the links that you can refer in order to get more context about this project and that's the gita channel here and uh, this is the project repository that you can take a look at so this brings me back to the slide where if there's any questions so if you want to ask any questions then this is the best time don't forget if you want to ask questions you can use the q and a option at the bottom uh, of the screen type your question and uh, we're going to answer it so diraj from my side were there any things where you were concerned about scalability or or the fact that you're sweeping when you're doing these kind of probes you're running across 1800 repositories in git so were there any scalability issues that you had to worry about or or concern for yes so that's a good question thanks for that so about the scalability concerns when we were running uh, some specific kind of probes which um, which were dealing with hitting the github server so those kinds of uh, probes were communicating with the github server via those apis and since as you said there are 1800 plus plugins and uh, when we run this engine there are going to be lots of uh, requests to the github api server so that that uh, easily shoots up past the limit set by github so that was an issue that we found out that hey for github related probes there's going to be a problem here so that was that was one of the concerns with that we had so we started using jgit uh, on, on that okay so that's one thing that we want to make sure uh, for the uh, github related probes for the audience to have access to the various links in uh, to Uh, Diraj's presentation. We're going to include it uh, into the main uh, slides, so they will be available. Yeah, we will make them available via the Meetup page at the end of the um, this Meetup. Okay, so one more minute to ask questions.
Okay, so thank you very much, Diraj, and thank you very much for sharing uh, your experience, what you what you learned uh, about with that project was indeed a very large one. And thank you for the mentors that uh, did a tremendous and very substantial work on that just by the sheer, sheer size uh, of the project. So thank you to all. We then are moving to uh, the next presentation. Uh, Yiming uh, worked on uh, uh, GitHub Actions uh, using Jenkins Runner. Yiming, the floor is yours. Okay, let me share my screen. Let me do this. Okay. Oops. So let me start. So hello everyone, my name is Yiming and I'm the Jenkins GSOC contributor of uh, Jenkins File Runner as GitHub Actions this summer. I'm happy to give the final presentation today about this project. I'd like to give a brief introduction about myself first. So now I'm a graduate student from Carnegie Mellon University. My major is electrical and uh, computer and engineering. Uh, in this project, my mentors are Chris and uh, Abia Daya. So, so our functional uh, interface is pretty simple uh, in this project. You only need to point out the rounding options and the relative path of Jenkins file, a JCSC YAM file and the plugin installation list file in your repository. Uh, as some people might not familiar with the tool in our actions, I listed some basic commands about them. Basically, we use the plugin installation manager to install the plugins specified by plugins installation list file and the Jenkins file runner to run the Jenkins pipeline. So Jenkins file runner action for GitHub Actions provides the customized containerized environment and the useful uh, GitHub Actions for users to run the Jenkins pipeline inside the GitHub Actions. In more detail, if using some, if using these actions, any GitHub project with uh, which has a Jenkins file can execute its workflow in the GitHub Actions runner. It aims at applying Jenkins in the GitHub Actions in a functional uh, as a service context. This feature is based on the Jenkins file runner, which is a command line tool for the Jenkins pipeline execution engine. Uh, here is a basic architecture of these actions. So I combined Jenkins core, a minimum required set of plugins to run the pipeline uh, and uh, plugin installation manager and the Jenkins file runner into a base image. Then I set up the entry point shell scripts to start up the container workflow. So in the second phase of, the, of this coding uh, project, I developed the GitHub actions, which uh, don't require the container runtime. So users uh, can directly run the pipeline in the host machine and all the dependencies are downloaded for each run. So the coolest part of this runtime action is that uh, users can run them in all of the runners provided by GitHub Action, uh, which are Linux, Mac OS, and the Windows runners. So previously, JFR static image action and the JFR container action, these actions can only be run uh, in Linux runners. Uh, so as you can see, there are some differences in our current actions, uh, but the root cause of these differences is the starting time of Jenkins container. In, in JFR container, container action, the Jenkins container uh, starts up before all GitHub actions execution and ends after all GitHub actions and have results. So all GitHub actions will have influences on the container. This means you can use other actions in the marketplace to set up the environment. But in JFR static image action, the Jenkins container postpones the starting time. It will start off right up before the JFR static image action starts and end right after the JFR static image action ends. So in this case, the Jenkins working container has strong isolation with the host machine. 
so users cannot use other uh, actions to set up the container environment except the actions checkout. Uh, when it comes to the runtime actions, uh, it doesn't require container contacts, so it doesn't have the related problems I described it before. You can use them with other actions in the marketplace. So how can you use our actions? I provide five Jenkins file runner actions in my project now. They are called JFR plugin installation action, JFR runtime action, JFR setup action, JFR container action, and the JFR static image, image action. You can use this action URLs in the PBT or uh, in your workflow definitions directly. So besides the repositories of these Jenkins file GitHub actions, I also provide the central documentation. So the central documentation includes a user guide and the developer guide. And I also provide the demo repository. Uh, the demo repository tells the users how to use these actions to compile uh, different programming languages projects. What's more, uh, it also includes how to use the Jenkins secrets environment variables and how to play with other plugins with, with JCSC. So now I'd like to show you a live demo about how to compile a Spring Boot demo project by using a uh, JFR setup action, JFR plugin installation action, and the JFR runtime action. So let's see. Uh, so this is a Spring Boot project. As you can see, there is nothing special here. And uh, you can use the Spring initializer provided by IDA to generate this example. And uh, let me see. Let me see. So, so usually we usually put put our uh, workflow definition under the GitHub workflows uh, folder, and uh, there's a YAML file here. So, this YAML file is uh, your workflow definition. So, what I define here. Uh, so firstly, you can, as we use the runtime actions, we can uh, run it in different kind of uh, runners provided by GitHub Actions. There are Ubuntu, uh, Mac OS, and uh, Windows. So, and so firstly, you need to uh, call the actions checkout to set up your uh, workplace. Workplace, and uh, secondly, you need to call JFR set up action. Uh, to set up the Jenkins file runner action environment. So if you uh, want to install extra plugins, you need to provide a, a plug, plugins text file, list file, and uh, you need to point out, you need to use the JFR plugin installation action to download the, the extra plugins. So finally, you only, need to, you only need to use the JFR runtime action to launch your exact pipeline. Uh, and uh, don't forget to provide the rel relative path to your Jenkins file and your JCSC file. So what I did here is to, what I do here is use the uh, Jenkins file to compile the whole Spring Boot project by using uh, Maven and uh, JDK8. So I need to use, use the JCSC to install the Maven and the JDK8. So as I need to install the JDK8, I might need to provide the uh, extra plugins to install it because you need to install the Adopt Open JDK. So its name is Adopt Open JDK plugin. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. So all I need to do is to commit my commit my let's see commit all the changes here. So let's see. 
So you can see the new workflow is running here. And uh, we, might, we might need to uh, wait uh, one or two minutes. Let's take the Ubuntu latest runner as an example. So you can see the workflow is running by using our actions. So the setup action is, is, uh, is uh, related to the JFR setup actions. And uh, now it using the uh, JFR plugin installation to, add, to install your extra plugins. And now you can see it is uh, using the JFR run action to run the, to compile the whole Spring Boot project by the uh, JFR uh, runtime action. Yeah. It almost reached to the end now. So we can see the pipeline uh, reaches to the end successfully. Uh, now back to the slide. So currently these actions are still under progress, although they have the basic functions to uh, run the uh, pipeline defined by users the pipeline result lacks readability for users. I'd like to show you uh, some logs about the pipeline. So as you can see, most parts of the log are useless to, to the users. So users, uh, they need to scroll down to find the uh, actual pipeline log here, uh, which are circled in red, red paint. So furthermore, uh, in the classic, uh, in the classical Jenkins server, users can virtualize their pipeline in different steps, but this function is not supported in current Jenkins file uh, GitHub actions. So currently the readability uh, for the Jen Jenkins file runner as GitHub action uh, is pretty bad. I expect to solve this readability problems in the near future or maybe find an alternative method to solve these problems. So in the end, I really appreciate the help from the Jenkins community. Uh, my mentor, Chris and Abadal always give me a uh, valuable advice. Jane Mark always likes to hear my personal feelings or opinions uh, during the project development phase. Also, Oleg helped me uh, find the correct path in this project at the beginning of the coding period. And also uh, finally, thanks Alisa for coordinating so many online meetings because I don't think it's a easy job. And so thanks for listening. Thank you very much, uh, Yiming, thank you. So just uh, opening for questions. Are there are any questions? So, for me, GitHub GitHub actions have been complicated by working with when working with credentials. Jimming, have there been any things that you learned in operating in a credentialed environment in GitHub that you want to share with others, or were there insights you gained when you were dealing with credentials in GitHub? So usually, what I what I did is, uh, for example, you can go to the. So this is my this is my. Uh, Let's see, this is my personal project and you need to go to the settings page here and uh, let's see, there's a secrets, secrets here and you can click it and uh, you can update or set new repository secrets, secrets over here. So uh, if you, for example, if you want to use, uh, use, uh, use the, any extra a secrets you need to set up here and uh, call it in your workflow definition by using the uh, by using the environmental variables provided by GitHub Actions. Or if you want to use it in your uh, Jenkins, if you want to use it in your Jenkins pipeline, uh, you need to map it 
map these secrets into your uh, Jenkins run, running environment. Yeah. So these secrets are pretty safe, I think. So for example, if you want to echo uh, one of the secrets, uh, e the GitHub action, the GitHub actions runner will try to filter it. So, um, so the contributors or other people cannot see the actual content directly. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks very much. Yeah. Very good. Okay, we're running out of time or I, I just give 30 more seconds if somebody wants to ask a question. Meanwhile, I'm going to thank Yiming for the very interesting work uh, uh, done on that and for this, this very powerful demo on your work. And I'd like also to thank the mentors, Chris Stern, who uh, made that together with uh, uh, being an org admin uh, during this summer. So thank you very much, Chris and Abhya. I, yeah. I can't pronounce his name uh, completely. Chris, you wanted to add something? Um, no, it was a good job. Well done. Well done, indeed. Yes. And, and indeed, Yiming, uh, Alyssa behind the curtains uh, made a tremendous job in keeping all this on the rails and getting all the Patients, uh, done. Yeah. Thank you, Yiming. So the next presentation is um, Vian. The floor is yours now. Thank you, John Mark. Welcome to the presentation, everyone. I am Vihan, and I was a contributor at Google Summer of Code 2022. I'll share my screen, and then we can get started. I hope my screen is visible. Um, the presentation also. It's showing. Great. So my project was uh, about improving the pipeline test documentation generator. And uh, I was mentored by Kristen throughout the project. And um, I'll get started with the brief overview of what I did in the coding phase one. Um, these are some of the tasks that I uh, explain in the midterm meetup, and I'll just go through uh, go through them uh, briefly. Um, the some uh, the beginning uh, of the project was more UI oriented, and my task was to make uh, using the documentation more handy. So for that, I worked on uh, improving the sidebar scrolling behavior of the Jenkins documentation, which I can perhaps uh, demo over here. So this is an older deployment of the site, which shows the condition about everything before the Google Summer of uh, Code project was done. Uh, so this is one of the pages in the steps documentation itself. And this particular feature was uh, towards the entire website. And as you can see, the sidebar scrolls along with the main content. And when you are uh, visiting a uh, larger scroll page, this becomes uh, very hard to navigate. Um, so what I have done with it is I have made the sidebars uh, stick along with the main content, and then both of them can scroll independently. So that is what is meant by this independent scrolling. Secondly, uh, the change was to add a search filter. And as the name for this, this is uh, very trivial. And what it does is basically it uh, compensates the browser search feature in a separately dedicated search bar. And what this provides over the browser search is it filters out the content on the page itself. So the content you see here is dynamic. And if I enter some string, maybe that matches it. So SCM, for example, then you can see all the uh, steps or the plugins that have that particular keyword in them. And this feature also came in handy for one of the changes that I made in coding page two, uh, which to which I'll get back to in, a, uh, in some time. Uh, the third task was to uh, separate the declarative steps from the main class. So uh, pipeline steps are of two types, declarative and uh, scripted. And uh, the steps that are dedicated towards declarative pipeline steps are generated using separate functions, not the regular functions. And those functions, we thought that it's better to separate them from the main class, which is the pipeline step extractor class. And hence, making, making the main class more readable and mo bringing some more modularity to our code. Um, the fourth change was to uh, shift our data, uh, parameter data types on our main website. Uh, I'll just show a quick example of what I mean by that. 
Um, so here, as you can see, uh, for each of the parameters, for example, for clear case SCM, this is a parameter class under the SCM, check out SCM step. And uh, this gives us some uh, parameters such as branch label, extract config, and all of them have some particular data types that a user needs to know when they want to write the Python script. And this was uh, this data was present in a new line after the help text. So here, as you can see, there is no help text available. But if you scroll down a little bit and you see some things such as a name here uh, for the data type of the name, you have to scroll through the head text. And after that, when the text ends, you see the data type over here. And this has been resolved using a very simple fix is that is to move the data type within the uh, in line with the name of the parameter itself. So here, as you can see, uh, the, uh, the parameter names are in line. And this also reduced the overall scrolling length of the website, um, thus reducing the content that we have. Uh, moving on, uh, the last thing, but not the least, was to release pipeline metadata utils. This was a tool that was under development. And uh, what it does, it is provides users a plugin manager, which they can use to query their plugins. Um, what it does is basically, for example, when to my project, I have to extract data about the steps. So uh, there is a file which is known as a plugin help text. And for every plugin we query that, we form a data structure, a map, a descriptor, and we store data for that um, using a hyperlocal plugin manager. So we query that using our, our plugin manager. And that can that has been made more portable using pipeline metadata utils. And that particular feature that we were using only specific to our project can be used outside also now. So this is a Maven artifact, which can be uh, easily user dependency in your form. I'll link all these things in, on my project page. And uh, I'm also writing a blog, which will be released after the meetup, uh, which will contain all the important links. So moving on towards coding phase two, what the things that I did. Um, Coding phase two was a more specific, specific, you know, focused uh, coding phase part of the project, and the main task was to uh, make the uh, pages more lightweight. You know, reduce the content on those pages. That was the main goal of the project. Um, so that was the thing that I was searching for the solutions for that. And before that, there was a small change in which we had to label the deprecated plugins on the pattern self reference page, uh, and this was done because. Earlier, there was no way to identify if uh, a pipeline steps mentioned by a plugin, the plugin itself is deprecated or not. And for example, you want to use that uh, step, and then after that, you realize the plugin is deprecated. Uh, that won't be very useful for the user. And the only way to know if the plugin was deprecated was uh, was using the um, hold on. Uh, was using the plugin site. So clicking through that plugin site of that plugin and going to the page and seeing if it's deprecated or not. Um, so I thought that maybe the query of, uh, you know, seeing the list of all deprecated plugins that provide pipeline steps could be helpful for other pipeline developers. And what I did was I used the update center uh, as Dheeraj mentioned in this project before uh, to see if a plugin is deprecated or not. So I have a list of all the plugins that provide pipeline steps. I have a map of that. And I can simply iterate through the keys of those that map and see whether that has an entry uh, as a deprecation to true in our update center file. Uh, and if that is the case, then we'll add a deprecated text label near that plugin's name itself. So this uh, this is very helpful uh, when you want to uh, basically see all the deprecated deprecated plugins. So if I simply uh, type deprecated in my search filter, you can see that, yeah, these four are the plugins that are deprecated and also provide pipeline steps to us. And if we simply type deprecated over here, we'll also get the steps that, uh, uh, that the steps that have the text deprecated associated with them. So both these things are possible. This is basically a superset of the previous query. Okay, so we, moving on towards the main, uh, uh, idea of the project that was to separate the configured parameters to a new ASCII doc. Uh, the project was about separating some of the larger sections of the steps documentation towards a place such that a user need, uh, uh, is not um, bombarded with a large amount of information on a single page. Uh, what it does is it, it makes a page very hard to navigate through and uh, it basically the content becomes of little use. 
uh, when the information is not organized very well. So this was a task to uh, accomplish in this project. Um, so some of the observations that I did before I started coding were that um, there are around eight uh, big plugin pages that contribute to about 85% of the total size of the ASCII docs. Um, the total size before the project was uh, done was around 16.7 MBs. This is uh, basically all the ASCII docs that we see on Pipeline Steps Reference, all the ASCII docs that come within that. And here, here are some of the examples of those ASCII docs. So for example, workflow multi-branch uh, had a size of 4.967 KBs, which is around 5 MBs. Pipeline Groovy was 2.2 MBs and workflow SCM step was around 0.4 MBs. So these are actually very big if you see uh, how lightweight ASCII docs are in general. So uh, the task was to make these pages smaller in size. But what was the issue behind that? Um, here are some problems that we are facing because of these larger pages. Uh, uh, we have a JavaScript that runs, uh, that collapses these documentation lines. So for example, if you're seeing these collapse sections over here, this is happening uh, dynamically after the ASCII doc is loaded and a JavaScript uh, function collapses this lists into these sections. And that was taking a huge amount of time uh, when it was running on the a page of this size. And uh, yeah, for example, the multi-branch plugin page took around 20 seconds on my browser to load and become stable. And even after it was loaded, it was crashing the browser many times. And the experience overall was not very smooth. It was a very laggy experience, I should say. And yeah, here are some of the useful investigations. A lot of the documentation that we saw was redundant. Uh, that is many of the text present within a same plugin page or across multiple plugin pages had the exact same content. And uh, we know that redundancy is not good in any kind of documentation. So this was something that uh, uh, was needing some kind of remedy from our side. Uh, secondly, um, we realized that if we separate every parameter and necessary choice to a new page, it won't help the redundancy issue much because we are anyways just shifting one, uh, one, one thing from the uh, main page to a separate page for itself. And it was not dealing with the redundancy at all. Uh, I'll show an example of the redundancy in the previous deployment that we had. Um, okay. So for example, if I go towards multi-SCM over here. Okay, here it is. So as you can see, multi-SCM, the list it contained had the exact same uh, uh, SCM classes as we have on the main page itself. So it's basically a recursive list that is present in itself. Um, so multi-SCM has multi-SCM again in itself but it ends because it has been set like that, the threshold, so that the depth is not increased by more than one. But basically we have every single parameter such as the Git SCM, everything is present again. So this is one of the examples of redundancy present in the same page itself. So this needed some kind of sort of a solution. So the idea that we thought could be done was, uh, one approach could be to deal with it uh, using uh, in the two ASCII doc generation process itself. So when we are converting those Java maps to ASCII docs, uh, can we maybe identify those parameter blocks and see if that content is redundant or not, and see if we want to separate that content from uh, that page from where it is supposed to be loaded to a newer page. But what I realized was that uh, identifying this particular uh, parameter of the number of lines within a parameter is not very easy because here we are dealing with Java maps and uh, it is basically calling a recursive function as I mentioned before. And hence, if we visualize it like a tree, I would say that uh, measuring the depth of the tree is not an easy task in this case. So uh, we thought of having a post-processing sort of uh, layer, which would iterate through these ASCII docs, which are now just strings and maybe identify list blocks within them that can be separated onto new pages. Uh, so this is the approach that we thought would be feasible. And this is what we went through with. And here are some implement implementation details of what we did. Um, process ASCII doc was designed to be a middle layer between generating and exporting the ASCII doc. So before the project writes, it out, writes its output like an all ASCII.zip file, this layer uh, reduces the content, you know, abstracts the whole thing out and then writes it onto the final thing. 
and for every configured class we have um, and uh, for every configured class in our configuration file we iterate through the entire documentation to find its occurrences and then localize it to one specific place uh, which is uh, in, in a folder na named as params so all those uh, new occurrences have been assigned to the folder name params and this is just a single file now and all those other files will reference to the single file on this location so in that way we, we have cleared our the redundancy completely um okay yeah you have and, uh... A minute and a half left. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. I, I just, that's Sorry true. to that's push you. <laughs> okay, so basically, this is just a flowchart of what I mentioned right now. And um, here are some results that I would like to share finally. Um, mm -hmm. So the size of the uh, uh, final ASCII docs has been reduced by more than two MBs. And this is all the redundancy that we're getting rid of. And these specific pages on their own have been reduced a lot in size. So earlier, if you remember, this workflow multi-branch was five MBs in size. It's now just 0.7 MBs. Uh, and all of these things can be seen on the main website itself. It's all in deployment. And you can see the new example. Um, so for example, I was looking for multi-SCM before. As you can see, it's just a new link now. And we can click through this link uh, and the whole documentation will be on localized as a single place. And Git SCM over there would be same as a Git SCM over here, if, you, uh, if you're understanding what I mean. It's just a single ASCII doc that has been referenced by two different locations. So in that way, I was able to uh, remove the redundancy uh, altogether. And we have a configuration file in which we can configure, the, the maintainers can configure the parameters and this is what it looks like. Um, so for example, I have mentioned Git SCM over here, multi-SCM over here. And this has made the pages uh, very lightweight. So currently we have around 36 parameters configured. And as and when we increase it, uh, the project will become, the effect of the project will become more and more evident. Um, so yeah, these are some uh, some future scope for improvements and uh, which you can go through my slides and my project page as well. I would say the main uh, goal for the future GSOC could be to integrate the snippet generator with Jenkins at IO. This was something. This was something that we went over multiple times trying to find implementations for, but uh, due to the lack of time, we weren't able to. But I'm sure this would be a very, uh, very valuable addition in the future for us. Okay, so I'd just like to acknowledge all the people who helped me throughout: uh, Kristen, John, Mar, Mar, Kevin, Alyssa, uh, the entire community of Jenkins Talks. Thanks a lot, and uh, please let me know if you have any questions regarding this. I'm sorry so, to have rushed you. It was a very dense uh, presentation. Thank you, Vihan. Mark, you had a question. I, I did, actually. So, Vihan, there were some analytical things that you did there. Any guidance you'd give us the, the things about page load time and about, about um, expansion time? Were there techniques you used to, to identify the hot problems there that others of us should know about? I, it, it, taking a page... 10x reduction in size of a page is pretty amazing. Well done. Were there things you used to find those pages in the initial? What Anything you wanted to share there? Um, yes, so most of the configuration that I did was a manual process. And hence, this was also kind of a drawback of the project that I wrote in the scope of increments. So I had to manually figure out sections that were having ASCII docs more than 1,000, 10,000 lines. And Configuring those uh, parameters is what I did right now. But in the future, what we can do is we can set a threshold that if you have any parameter block that exceeds maybe 10,000 lines of block, maybe move them to a new page. So, but that could have been a, an expensive thing considering this is built uh, on a weekly schedule. And hence we thought that having a balance with the manual work and the build times is the best way to go for now. Okay. Thank you, Vihan. Thank you for the, the mentors uh, that participated in uh, a very interesting project uh, too, like the, the others. So we'll try to move on uh, Thanks, and keep the timetable uh, honest. So um, Mark, uh, can you share with us uh, what was the work that uh, Hushikesh uh, made under, under your mentorship? The floor is yours. You're on mute, Mark. Rushikesh worked on Git cache maintenance. 
and we're very grateful to him. His his family schedule didn't allow him to attend today, so I'm going to do a week a week version of it. Let's note that get cash maintenance. Thanks to Rishab for being a mentor as well. Um, the task that's challenging here, that's hiding in all this, is how do we deal with things that are sort of contrary to the nature of Git. So Git, as envisioned by Linus Torvalds and maintained by a great team of maintainers, focuses on fast, immediate operations and is willing to sacrifice larger operations or long-term operations to the benefit of short-term operations. For instance, it chose, chooses intentionally not to garbage collect on every operation that a user does. Therefore, we can collect things over time when we have long living historic caches that need tidying. Prushakesh, uh, as a, our contributor, provided a great start on this to allow Git to help allow us to have Jenkins automatically maintain its caches. And the challenges are hiding in the fact that Git, by its nature, focuses on fast operations for developers, not on long-term storage of fast access for big bulky processes like a Jenkins process. So the caches in Jenkins sit behind the controller and they remember things about particularly large repositories. If you can imagine, the Linux kernel, as one example, is over two gigabytes as a repository. We certainly do not want to copy two gigabytes every time we need to ask a question of it. So we cache it. That caching helps, but those caches may become dirty or they may become untidy. They become suboptimal over time. And this cache maintenance exercise helps us improve that with automated garbage collection, with automated prefetch so that when it, the time comes to ask a question, much of the question has already been asked. Uh, commit graphs and loose objects as well. So Git caching and Git maintenance improvements help users by getting work done faster. So I'm going to show you a brief, a brief screenshot of what Git cache maintenance looks like. It's like this. So when you install the Git plugin after this is released, you'll have a Git maintenance button here in Manage Jenkins. And here's the configuration page. Tells you what Git version you're running. And here are the, the cache operations that you can do. I've said to do this one once a day. Oh, this is another way of saying once a day. And and all of the syntaxes that are used for Git cache operations are available, or that are used for Jenkins cron jobs and Jenkins jobs in general are available here. The results we see are in a nicely presented table. So here's a good example of a 160 megabyte repository that I use and on which I depend. And we see when I expand all sorts of results here. Hey, here's the cleanup that ran to garbage collect this thing in seven seconds. That garbage collection means that I waste much less time later when I access that repository. Those kinds of operations are exactly what ca automated cache maintenance does for users. Now, there's a, a bunch to be gained from this. Users will define the schedule on which maintenance is performed, the maintenance get executed, and they get benefits. On the flip side, there were some real challenges for Fushikesh. Um, he was learning things that were outside our expertise as mentors. Um, I don't know how to do really good Jenkins UIs. Rishab, I think, felt similarly. Uh, he was doing things with a wide range of Git versions. An ancient Git version as installed on CentOS and Red Hat 7, all the way up to the most modern Git versions installed on Windows or on BSDs all have to be handled by this one set of code. We're really grateful for what Rushikesh did. He did a great job handling the challenges. We look forward to, to merging that and having it delivered in an upcoming release of the Git plugin. John Mark, that's really all I had. Well, you, you really impressed me in doing a very condensed, rich 
uh, presentation of the work of Harun Cash. So thank you very much for jumping in and congratulations to uh, Hoshi Cash, the mentor team, as well as all the other participants uh, that, uh, that presented uh, their work here. It was really a great um, summer of code. So I want to thank on behalf of the org admin team here, uh, thank you to the very impressive and formidable uh, GSOC contributors, the mentors. Without the mentors' help, uh, this would not have been uh, possible. It was a learning process. And like Mark said, we all learned from it uh, working together. That was uh, really, uh, really great. Next slide. So we're getting prepared for the next session. Uh, Google did not disclose uh, exactly if, when, how the next session, but uh, it, will, it will happen. Uh, so uh, we as a project will apply. This is a decision made by this, the, the outreach uh, SIG. That means that we uh, need mentors. Uh, we need project ideas. There will be an uh, announcement for that. Uh, if you want to join uh, the uh, uh, org admin team, let us know. Uh, I think that Chris will uh, join again for next year. So uh, the team is nearly complete. Thank you, for Chris, for, for joining. Alyssa is on board too. Uh, I need her help because she's she's been key in the startup uh, part, and um, I will also continue. But if somebody wants to uh, to join the effort as uh, org admin, I'll uh, send a message uh, for that. We don't want to work as a closed club. Uh, everybody can join. So uh, I'm calling to the community through this uh, discussion or this online meetup and there will other announcement. We need mentors, we need project ideas. It's a very interesting experience for the contributors, but also for the mentors and has a big impact uh, on the Jenkins project. Here are some resources. Uh, they will be available on the, uh, on the slides. And this is basically what I have. Yes, I can. Well, that, that was a good, good point. Maybe, uh, Elisa, you can jump on that. So we wrap up uh, the meeting. Or do you want me to give a word? Uh, for this slide? Yeah. OK, yeah. So, um, so well, Jean-Marc, you can give a couple second on Hacktoberfest, but we, that is taking place right now. Uh, DevOps World was supposed to be last week because of the hurricane in Florida. Hurricane, yes. <laughs> that was a bit fun. Um, so DevOps World was canceled. So we they will schedule an online virtual event. So that is TBD at the moment. And then, of course, FOSDEM is our another annual um, open source event that we go to every year. So that is going to be in person next year. That is going to take place in February the 4th and the 5th. And we are planning to be there. And it takes place in Brussels. So yeah. I can go uh, with my bicycle up to the conference. It will be at the main university of yeah. uh, Brussels. Uh, small, small details here. Uh, I was ready to start the conference, but was not blown away by the wind. So and came back home uh, in one piece. So uh, it was for a reason uh, that DevOps was uh, canceled. The hurricane was there again. You've seen it on the on the news. Oktoberfest is uh, really going strong now. Um, so we had yesterday the live stream where we the kickoff live stream of Oktoberfest. Uh, join us. Um, we'll have another uh, community-oriented uh, live stream uh, next Tuesday. Uh, it will. It is announced on uh, various channel and YouTube uh, channel. So I will not hijack the online meetup to do the promotion of that event. 
And final word, I say thank you to everybody, to Elisa for organizing this, this online meetup, to all the participants, uh, to this very rich and very fun summer and the time we spent uh, uh, together. And I give the final word to Elisa. Sure. Um, yeah, thank you, GSOC contributors. Thank you, especially to mentors as well. Um, I felt this this project went really well this year. And if there's room for improvement, please, I will start a document. Um, I'd love to get your feedback, how we can make things better for next year. But um, your contribution has been invaluable. So please note that. Um, and you know, you're always welcome to come back and continue to contribute and mentor others as well. So thank yeah. you very much. Okay, with that being said, we'll end this call. Thanks, everybody.